Welcome to The Freak Show, fellow freaks. I'm Matthew Brockmeyer, the Humboldt lycanthrope. I'm Sarah Hartman. And this is... Murder Coaster. Step right up, step right up, ladies and gentlemen. If you dare, that is. For today, we're going to take you deep into the most deviant and foul of minds. Minds that long and pine to see real life, torture, and death on the screen in the form of the infamous snuff film. Minds that find sexual pleasure and gratification in watching images of lurid brutality and murder. Minds so obsessed with these underground films of documented carnage and terror that they decide to get behind the camera and make their own. Today we bring you Snuff Film Killers. The word snuff literally means the part of a candle wick that is already burnt and has been used as a slang word for death for hundreds of years. But it wasn't until 1971 that it was conjoined with the word film to mean a filmed murder. The term snuff film was first used in 1971 by Ed Sanders in his book, The Family, alleging Charlie Manson had made snuff films. Right, because, you know, blame everything on that guy. You might as well accuse him of making snuff films while you're at it. But Sanders had created a word that caught the imagination of popular culture and took off, soon fixating itself in the modern lexicon. Within five years of Sanders inventing the word, it was being exploited in the classic horror film Snuff, which billed itself as a real snuff film to gather attention. Today's snuff film is a term that nearly everyone has heard at one time or another. But the concept of a snuff film goes way back to 1907, when Polish-French writer Yeme Apollinaire, that's, that's a writer's name, he wrote the short story, A Good Film. In the story, photojournalists stage and film a murder because the public is so fascinated by true crime news. And this is in 1907. It cracks me up because I always hear people talking about this modern fascination with true crime. People have been obsessed with true crime for as long as true crime has existed. Right? Maybe not such a modern fascination after all. Definitely not. <laughs> but is the snuff film even a real thing? Google it, and you'll get a bevy of answers. Fangoria Magazine says that the answer is no, explaining that the definition of a snuff film is a financed for-profit production featuring real-life torture and killing. And while there is footage out there, you can find real-life videos of torture and killing. These weren't made by a film studio for profit. Fangoria states that the idea of a production team creating snuff films for profit, like, say, in that Nicolas Cage movie, 8mm, is an urban legend. They say, an underground industry with people being murdered for the amusement of others, not a chance. Snuff films are uh, often faked. The August Underground trilogy, in a genius marketing ploy, originally released the first of their fake snuff films on the dark web, claiming it to be real. Also, famously, the classic cult found footage film, and I don't know, I, this might be the first found footage horror film ever, the legendary Cannibal Holocaust, has footage that was so realistically gruesome and intermixed with actual scenes of animal death Oh, man, I feel so bad for that poor turtle. Every time I watch that scene, it makes me want to donate to an animal charity as penance for having seen it. Oh, 
I want some turtle soup when I watch it. Yeah. <laughs> they did eat it. <laughs> Maybe that's better. At least they. Eat it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. My vegetarians and my vegans out there are not going to agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the the film appeared so realistic that authorities thought it was an actual snuff film, and the filmmakers had to prove it wasn't real in court. That's actually a really interesting story. Ten days after Cannibal Holocaust premiered in Milan, the local magistrate ordered it be confiscated, and the director, Ruggiero Diodato, was charged with obscenity. They had to smuggle out bootleg copies to theaters in other countries. And when it was shown in France, the magazine Photo suggested that some of the death scenes were real and it was an actual snuff film. So they amended the charges against Diodato to include murder. And it didn't help at all that trying to hype the movie as an actual snuff film for publicity, Diodato had the actors the magistrate thought were murdered sign contracts saying that they wouldn't appear in any type of media for one year following the film's release. Yeah. People wanted to know why the actors were in no other media if they were alive, as Diodato claimed. So to prove his innocence, Diodato arranged for four of the actors to be interviewed on an Italian television show. Diodato also explained in court how the iconic and legendary impalement scenes were filmed. And they are gnarly looking, like a naked woman suspended on a sharpened pole which goes through her lower back and out her mouth. I'd say we'd put pictures of it up on social media, but Sarah's probably going to tell me we shouldn't. You know, you can't piss off the social media overlords. <laughs> well, you would know, wouldn't you? Mm, yes, I may have gotten in trouble a couple times for posting questionable contents. Not you. Uh, <laughs> It's arbitrary. They they picked some people and they let other people do it. Uh, whatever. You Sarah, do it. <laughs> I, I they they got their eye on me these days. I'll tell you what, man. But Sarah over here is actually an amazing special effects wizard herself. She's even met Tom Savini and hung out with Guar after creating an awesome ball sack costume. That's so nice of you to mention after I just picked on you. Oh, <laughs> now I feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, to get back to Cannibal Holocaust, though, what they did to create that legendary shot is they attached a bicycle seat to the end of an iron pole, which the actress sat on. She then held the short part of the sharpened stake, which was just balsa wood so that it was very light in her mouth and looked skyward. And voila, quite simple, actually. But doused in copious amounts of fake blood, it really gives her the appearance of being impaled, suspended up there on that bicycle seat. And uh, not to be too creepy of a pervert, but I just have to say, the fact that she is like stunningly beautiful and naked really helps with the illusion. Because when I first saw that image as a little kid, I can tell you I wasn't looking at the stake. <laughs> okay, take it easy, Maddie. We get it. You appreciate fine art. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Diodato also provided the court with pictures of that girl interacting with the crew after the scene had been filmed. And after they were presented with that evidence, the courts dropped all the murder charges against him. Of course, real life killers have been documenting their sick crimes with film, photos, and audio recording for as long as film, photos, an auto recording have existed. People like Harvey Glattman, who lured girls to the desert for photo sessions, or Moore's killers, Ian Brady and Myra Hindley, who made tape recordings of their crimes. And that was also done by the toolbox killers, Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris. Ugh, just just mentioning those audio tapes, it gives me the willies. And with the creation of the video camera and the smartphone, all kinds of murdering deviants have filmed their dastardly deeds. Like the Ken and Barbie killers, Carla Homoka and Paul Bernardo, 
and the Dnipropeskov maniacs, whose video, Three Guys, One Hammer, was leaked online. And the Dnipropeskov maniacs, who, if you didn't know, were just some psychotic teenagers going around bashing people's heads in with a hammer in the Ukraine. They claimed at one point that they'd filmed the murders for a snuff film syndicate that sold the videos online. But there was no proof of this whatsoever. There was also the incredibly barbaric and cruel Mari Travis, whom we may one day cover if we can keep our loathing and disgust down enough to write a script for it. And most famously, Luca Magnata, who produced, co-starred, and marketed his own snuff world for the world to see. And we're going to get really into him soon, dear listeners and fellow freaks. This entire episode is just a warm-up to our Luca episode, which is coming very soon. But the question is, has there ever been a for-profit production team creating real torture and snuff films? And the answer, unfortunately, my dear listeners, appears to be yes. Investigative journalist Julie Bindel says she was able to buy a snuff film by walking into an English pornography shop and simply asking the man behind the counter for something extreme. The film she was sold, created in South America, showed a woman being raped and murdered, including having her hand cut off while she was still alive. Before handing the tape over to police, she showed this film to special effects people and cinematographers. They all agreed. It appeared very authentic. Ugh. Yeah. Hey. Don't weird. go into an English porno shop asking for extreme stuff. Just don't, don't do it. Thanks. I, uh, I'll take that off my list immediately. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, there, there's no denying the existence of Hurtcore and the film Daisy's Destruction, which was sold and streamed on the dark web for upwards of $10,000. Among other atrocities, an 11-year-old girl named Cindy was allegedly forced to dig her own grave and strangled to death. Hurtcore is such a disturbing and twisted rabbit hole, we're not even going to get into it. Maybe one day we'll discuss it, but maybe not. It's too extreme for us. It's, it's pretty bad. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> well, while incredibly rare torture and even snuff films do exist films that are financed films and made for profit which leads us to our topic for today snuff film killers in particular two men who became so obsessed with watching snuff films that they decided to try their own hand at making one themselves before we get into these separate cases maybe sarah who is a licensed psychotherapist can tell us a little bit about the psychology of someone who would get a sexual thrill from watching violence and murder, so much so that they actually wanted to make their own snuff film. I mean, this is a form of sadism, right? Sadism and a fantasy life so deep it begins to overlap with reality. Let's talk about that term, sadism, and its psychological implications. Sadistic personality disorder is considered defunct as a diagnosis. But the most recent edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health, or the DSM-5 for short, contains a section on paraphilic disorders, which includes sexual sadism disorder. But before we go any further, though, I want to address a common misconception. A paraphilic disorder, or paraphilia, as it was known in previous editions of the manual, does not refer to any unusual sexual behavior, atypical sexual interest, or kink that a person has. Less common sexual interests are not considered pathological. Per the American Psychological Association, an individual would not meet criteria for paraphilic disorder unless their behavior causes mental distress to that individual 
or makes that person a serious threat to the psychological and physical well-being of others. So in other words, just liking violent imagery or participating in mildly sadistic sexual practices with other consenting adults would not be enough to merit a diagnosis of sexual sadism disorder. In order to meet that criteria, a person's sadistic behavior, fantasies, or intense urges must also result in clinically significant distress or functional impairment and or harm to others. A Psychology Today article, which you can find in our show notes, cited an instance in which 15 fMRI brain scans were conducted of violent offenders who met the criteria for this paraphilic disorder. Apparently, the scan showed greater than average brain activation of the amygdala when the individuals were shown images depicting pain. These individuals were then also asked to rate the level of pain being experienced in each photo, and they rated it higher than the control group. And the control group is individuals without the diagnosis who were tested for comparison purposes. Empirical evidence does show a positive correlation between sexual sadism disorder and criminal behavior. And there's also an association between psychopathic personality traits and sadism. We know the subjects of today's cases did take their fantasy lives into reality, and that was severely detrimental to non-consenting individuals involved. And without diving too far in already, I'll invite our listeners to consider that recent studies have shown that psychopathy affects attention and processing. Yale University psychologist Ariel Baskin Summers, PhD, has been studying individuals with psychopathy and their patterns of information processing. Not only do individuals with antisocial personality disorder and psychopathy experience problems related to executive functioning, meaning individuals with psychopathy might commit antisocial acts because they have difficulty planning ahead. Uh, they have difficulty stopping once they get started with something. They also experience issues related to focus and attention. Individuals with psychopathy experience what Baskin Summers calls an exaggerated attention bottleneck. In other words, they have difficulty filtering information when it first comes in. And Baskin Summers notes in her research, quote, people with psychopathy become so myopically focused on one small part of their attentional field that their brain processes the rest of that information too slowly to inform the next step, end quote. So be thinking about this recent finding as we examine the actions of both Jamie Reynolds and Peter Madsen. All right, buckle up. Here we go. Part one, Jamie Reynolds, or as I like to call him, the English douchebag moron killer. Great title. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Jamie Reynolds first got into snuff films when he was only 14 in 2004. I feel like this kid was uh, jacking off to images on Rotten.com. And look, I understand morbid curiosity. I am a true crime and horror fanatic. I understand even the desire to see real life gore. I used to watch Faces of Death when I was a kid. And yeah, I used to frequent Rotten.com back in the day. But if you're getting feelings of sexual arousal from seeing this stuff, you need to check yourself. Remind yourself that these are fellow human beings. Maybe even see a mental health professional and talk about it before it escalates. And remember, whatever you're into, and we don't kink shame, just always practice safety, consent, and respect. Absolutely. That's a great reminder. Now, by the time Jamie was 22, in 2013, he'd amassed 16,800 images and 72 videos that authorities labeled as both snuff films and extremely violent pornography. I'm sure a lot of the so-called snuff was fake. 
like the famous image of the man eating a fetus that got the FBI and Scotland Yard investigating Rotten.com. But I feel like a few of them might have been a real thing. I mean, I don't know. They say he loved watching women have their throat slit, but he had a serious hanging fetish as well. Just getting like total Gerard John Schaefer vibes. Uh, this douchebag kid is a lot like the scumbag of the century in a lot of ways. We'll soon see. Oh, yeah. No, I'm glad they were never able to meet each other. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Can you imagine? Awful. It's a, kind of like a little mini me of him. Was... Right? Baby Gerard Schaefer vibes. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, in the neighborhood, Jamie was known to be a quiet kid who kept to himself. But those who knew him better said he tortured and killed neighborhood pets. Oh, here we go with the animals. With these sickos, yeah. In 2008, when he was 17, Jamie was arrested for attacking a 16-year-old girl. His parents were on vacation at the time, and he lured the girl into his house and attempted to strangle her. But she fought back and managed to break one of his ribs in the scuffle. Good for her. Fuck him. Right. Totally. But uh, I'm just going to tell everybody right now, there's a lot of police incompetence in this case. So get prepared to be angry. Though the girl had bruises on her neck from his fingers, the police didn't take any photographs. And though one of the cops described him as being one of the most dangerous people they'd ever met, they let him go with a quote unquote, final warning. A final warning. What's a final warning? I honestly, I don't know. It's, it's some kind of UK thing. I know here in America, if a cop gives you a final warning, it means you're about to be fucking shot. But uh, in England, I guess it's just like a very strict, boy, mate, now don't be doing that again. Off you go now, lad. Off you go. <laughs> Sure. Okay. That seems like a good enough working <laughs> definition for us here. So it's not long after that that Jamie's stepfather starts finding his weird porn. Now, let's face it. All teenage boys are looking at porn. It's perfectly normal. But like we mentioned earlier, this kid seems to have gotten his hands on snuff films and extreme shit, whether real or not. He'd also been doing that weird thing that BTK and Gerard Schaefer did where they doctored photos to make women appear bound and gagged, hanging from nooses, shitting and pissing on themselves as they were violated. But with the wonders of technology, this little sicko was able to use Photoshop to make it disturbingly realistic. He'd even take the faces from girls he knew on Facebook and put them on actual torture victims, writing disgusting and degrading things below them, even adding in lipstick. Like us here at Murder Coaster, his stepfather was also shocked and appalled, and he took the photos and the snuff films to the police. And the police, who basically did nothing, um, besides getting him a court-appointed psychiatrist, they didn't even inform the local girls whose images that he was using. And if they had, there's probably a very good chance there'd be at least one less dead girl in the world today. This is your final, 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 final warning. Second final warning. <laughs> Finalist final warning. Uh, the psychiatrist assigned to him said in a report, Reynolds has progressed from viewing violent pornography to acting it out. He should never be alone with a female. Oh, that's intense. Yeah. And uh, you, yeah. <laughs> he became a bit of an incel, writing things on social media like, he's cursed with women and would forever be alone. Oh, boo-hoo. Did I mention this guy is a douchebag and a moron? I can't understand why women don't like him. It's just a mystery. <laughs> yeah. Um, and in 2011, Jamie had been pursuing this woman, flirting with her, asking her out on dates, and she finally told him no. She had absolutely no interest in him, and she told him to fuck off and leave her alone. And what does Jamie do? He smashes his car into hers. 
and he tells the police that it was an accident, that he'd been depressed and he wasn't paying attention, and nothing happens from it at all. Final, final warning. So now our douchebag is 23 and working at a gas station when a pretty redheaded 16-year-old girl starts working at the gas station with him. Her name was Georgia Williams, and the two became quite friendly. She knew who he was. He lived down the street from her, and she'd seen him around. And he certainly knew who she was as well. Her older sister's best friends was one of the girls he'd photoshopped being hung and tortured. Oh, so if the police had told this girl what they found, she probably would have told Georgia's sister, who would have warned Georgia to stay away from him? Uh, exactly. That's that's what you'd think. That's what big sisters are for, right? I hope. But and the old... police didn't do that. No, I I don't know. And uh, old douchebag Jamie, he had a big thing for redheads. He began to pester Georgia for dates. He friended her on social media and slid into her DMs. Even once attempted to kiss her. Again, he's a 23-year-old man and she's a 16-year-old girl. And she rebuffed his advances. She told him she had a boyfriend and she only liked him as a friend. But she was a sweet girl. And when he told her his life dream was to become a photographer... And he was trying to get a photography portfolio together and needed a model. She agreed to pose for him and they set a date. Sunday, the 26th of May, 2013. George's parents were having a barbecue that day and they tried to convince their daughter to stay. But she said she had made a promise to a friend and she had to go. Besides, She felt bad because he'd asked her to go see Fast and Furious 5 with him, and she'd turned him down earlier. But she told her parents not to worry. There would be lots of other girls there modeling it, too. And it was just down the street. She'd call them. And let me guess. There were no other girls there, were there? No. There was no one there but him. Hmm. She left at 7.30. After a few hours, her mother grew worried and began to text and call. There was no reply. Then a single line of text appeared. Have gone out. We'll text later. We'll probably stay out. Kiss, kiss, kiss. She's 16, and it's a Sunday night. She's got school the next day. Yeah. And by the morning, her parents were in a pure panic. Jamie Reynolds was contacted. I mean... They knew that's where she was going. He's such a moron. And it was actually uh, George's sister who called him. Reynolds just claimed she had left early to go to a friend's house because uh, he hadn't been feeling well. The parents have obviously called the police. George's father actually worked for the police at this point, And the sergeant asks her father, we have a photo of him. Does he still have that weird haircut? It was then that her father realized something was amiss. Why did the police already have a photograph of this man? The police kicked his door right in and thoroughly searched his home. But it was clean, spotless. In fact, nothing was amiss. But they did find his camera. He deleted all the images on it, but guess what? Often, to a trained investigator... Those images don't go anywhere. Because they were able to recover photographs and video, and oh boy, were they ever. Jamie, you bloody daft knobhead, yeah. <laughs> Jamie told Georgia he wanted to take photos of her with a noose around her neck, standing on a box, explaining he later used Photoshop to erase the box and make it look like she was hanging. And Georgia went along with it. He'd even bought her an outfit to wear. A leather jacket, leather shorts and high heels, as well as bright red lipstick. He'd planned it all out in advance. 
He even had a notebook with George's phone code and phrases that she used in text, like kisses, so he could sound more like her when he texted her parents. That's his planning. Such a moron. So this is uh, his attempt to make fantasy life reality, right? Is this a sign of what? Like psychopathy, narcissism? And we talked about that attention bottlenecking, that hyperfixation on a particular subject matter and situational outcome, and difficulty planning ahead for individuals with psychopathy earlier in this episode. Why is that, though? Very recent studies by the American Psychological Association show that brain and neurological abnormalities may be responsible. A study conducted by the University of New Mexico and the Mind Research Network was published in 2017 by the Journal of Neuroscience that implicated structural and functional brain abnormalities in the brain imaging of 20 prisoners diagnosed with psychopathy. The images showed reduced white matter fibers connecting the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. This suggests that these two brain structures, responsible for emotion and social behavior, are not communicating properly. Moreover, research has shown that in cases of psychopathy, there is increased neuroresponsiveness in regions of the brain associated with reward processing. In other words, Jamie may be so obsessed with the outcome, manifesting his fantasy, that he may not fully be able to predict the consequences. And that's based in neuroscience. The last image of Georgia alive is of her standing on a red recycling box with a noose around her neck, smiling happily, as if in the middle of laughing. Her hands are tied behind her back. It's probably at this point while the sweet girl posed for that weird guy down the street's photo shoot, that Reynolds stepped up and kicked the box out from under her. He continued to film her, both still photos and videos, as she kicked and struggled and died. He then cut down her corpse and had sex with it. And he took it to the kitchen and again had sex with it, photographing himself in the act, then into the hallway. And then he laid out her corpse on his parents' bed, where he engaged in extensive sexual acts. Ugh, the parents' bed. It's uh, such a fuck you, right? You, you think there's some kind of Oedipus Freudian thing going on? Oh, Freud. Matt, you know, I love me mm. some psychoanalytic theory. Despite its lack of empirical evidence, I share a birthday with Sigmund Freud, May 6th. Different years, obviously. I'm not 167. Mm. But if I was, I would be looking awesome. You're looking and awesome. Hell yeah. <laughs> While Freud's uh, theories were groundbreaking at the time, nowadays they're really considered more applicable to philosophy and literature than the science of human psychology, but they're still interesting to discuss. A uh, complex, according to Sigmund Freud, is an unconscious wish in response to a challenge to one's mental wellness. The Oedipus complex, Freud theorized, was a universal response to the developmental changes a young boy faces as he comes of age. Specifically, this is a phase in every boy's life where he's becoming aware of his sexuality and is uncertain how to satisfy his newfound desires. And according to Freud, in his book, The Interpretation of Dreams, it's during this time that a boy unconsciously wishes to have sex with his mother and feels jealous and resentful of his father. A satisfactory resolution of that phase in life would see the child choose to identify with his father and move on to have healthy relationships with women. And a failure to get over this unconscious conflict would mean a pathological outcome. Unsurprisingly, 
There's no empirical evidence to support the Oedipus complex. It's considered BS for a number of reasons, and you probably don't have to be a psychologist to guess a few of them. Parent-child conflict is a common part of human development, and that is a scientific fact. Hormonal changes in adolescence do cause teenagers to become more emotionally volatile for a time, and the teenage brain demonstrates an increased capacity for logical reasoning, which is often accompanied by a desire to build an identity outside of one's own family system. But the conflicts resulting from these factors are much more likely to stem from questioning authority and a desire for independence rather than a desire for sexual possession of an opposite sex parent. And Jamie's 23 by this point. He's well past those angsty teenage years. He's living with mom and stepdad. I wasn't able to dig up a ton of information about Jamie's relationship with his parental figures, but I'm assuming that him and stepdad have at least somewhat of a contentious relationship, especially since stepdad just confiscated Jamie's pornography and reported him to the police and landed him a psych eval. I don't know if we have enough information to definitively say what motivated Jamie to bring that corpse into mom and stepdad's bed, but it seems like a fuck you on the surface to me. What a way to say fuck you. (laughs) I hate this moron. Well, then he loaded the corpse up into his dad's van and headed to the movies. And what do you think he saw? The Fast and the Furious Five. And why? Because he asked her out to see that film last week, and she rebuffed him. Now here he was, seeing the movie, and in a weird way, seeing it with her. So creepy, right? Oh, so creepy. And it just gets creepier. (laughs) Oh. The police also found 40 short stories he'd written, all about rape, torture, murder, and necrophilia. Yep, just like our narcissistic scumbag of the century, John Schaefer. This guy, he's just hitting all the check marks. He'd even written a story called Georgia Williams in Surprise, detailing his plans with horrific premeditation. In this story, he wrote, I can't wait to see you dance for me. I like my girls dead. That was a quality show, babe. Ugh, still baby Gerard John Schaefer vibes all over the place. Mini me. Yeah, there's a huge manhunt for this moronic douchebag. And uh, through CCTV footage, he's tracked to a parking garage in Glasgow, Scotland. He was arrested at the Premier Inn in Glasgow in the morning. He claimed temporary amnesia. When asked where the body was, he claimed he didn't know. He couldn't remember anything. I'm sure you believe him too, don't you, Sarah? Well, it's so incredibly convenient. How could I not? Though he probably remembers the entire plot to the Fast and the Furious Five. Just say. <laughs> uh, but uh, they still don't have a body. So the police made a public appeal on the show Crime Watch, detailing the details of the van he'd been driving. A father and daughter saw the show and contacted the police, saying they'd seen the van in Wales, stuck in the mud. The girl found it so funny, she even took a picture of this douchebag stuck in the mud. The police went to the place, and after just a short search, they found her corpse lying in a woodland bog. Oh. Less funny now. Yeah. Jamie showed up in court smiling and laughing without a trace of remorse and telling everyone he was innocent and he hadn't done it, even though there were actual photographs of him killing her and desecrating her body. The judge let him have it. He gave him the worst sentence they have over there in England, a whole life term. He said he was obviously a psychopath and would have progressed to becoming a serial killer. And now, Jamie Reynolds, English douchebag moron, rots in Wakefield's monster mansion, a high-security prison without any possibility of ever getting out. 
What a name for a prison. Monster Mansion. That's like cinematic almost. Yeah. I I think that's like what they call it. I think it's just called Wakefields, but the people are all Monster Mansion. I'm it's assuming. Memorable. I don't know. It, I don't know. I don't know why, but I, it would make a good breakfast cereal name. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. And now, dear listeners and fellow freaks, we bring you part two, Peter Madsen, Knife, Saw, and Video Camera, the submarine snuff film. Kim Wall was an award-winning Swedish journalist and all-around amazing woman who had two master's degrees and wrote for the New York Times, Vice, Harper's, Time Magazine, and the Atlantic, among others. Kim had seen a TED Talk with this Danish entrepreneur named Peter Madsen, who wanted to be the first amateur astronaut, and Kim was fascinated. Madsen had built three submarines and was now testing rockets and building a floating launch pad that he was going to tow to the Baltic Sea and fire rockets from. He called himself an inventorpreneur, which, whatever, I don't even know what to say about that. Wired Magazine told her they'd pay for an interview with this inventorpreneur, so uh, she went out to Denmark. But Peter Madsen was elusive and ignored her emails and calls. She had given up and was headed to a new assignment, but the night before she was to leave, when a big going away party was planned for her by her boyfriend, she received a text from Madsen asking if she still wanted that interview. She was all about it and at seven that night was off to finally meet this inventorpreneur and ride in his famous homemade submarine. She texted her boyfriend, I'm still alive, by the way. We're going now now. Love you. So ominous. Mm, yeah. That would be the last anyone would ever hear from her. Now about this Peter Madsen character, because he is definitely some kind of character, let me tell you. Though he'd taken a few welding and engineering classes, he had no real formal education. But he'd been an amateur rocket enthusiast since he was a very small child. He started a rocket company called Copenhagen Orbitals. But after constant bickering with his partner, who called him impossible to work with, he formed his own company. And by pure force of will, he converted an old shipyard in Copenhagen into Rocket Matson Space Laboratory. All the money was either donated, crowdsourced, or made by his lectures. And all the workers... The whole mess of interns and volunteers, they all worked for free. To me, it seems he was trying to give off this whole Elon Musk vibe and offering interested people an opportunity to get in on the ground floor. He was married, but in an open relationship. The pair liked to swing and were well known in the Danish fetish scene and the BSM community. I just want to say nothing wrong with that if it's consensual, and everyone's adults. As Matthew said earlier, we don't kink shame here at Murder Coaster. So, after showing Kim Wall his space lab, he takes her out for a ride in his submarine. It's supposed to be a two-hour trip where he'll grant her an exclusive interview. One of his interns notices that Peter is loading a saw, a knife, and a video camera into the submarine. The saw, which is a woodcutting saw, seemed really odd to him. Why would you need a wood saw on a steel submarine? At some point during the night, the submarine loses contact with the shore, just disappears. Kim's boyfriend is in a panic, as well as her friends who were throwing her a going away party. Remember, she's supposed to be leaving for China the next day. So in the morning... There's a huge rescue mission and police air and sea search, and they manage to spot the submarine. They spot it surfacing, and it's really weird. 
because the hatch opens. And when Peter sees the rescue team, he like goes back in and suddenly the whole submarine just sinks and he's swimming away. He's picked up by a rescue boat, but he's alone. Kim Wall is nowhere to be found. Immediately, authorities are suspicious. He's got scratches on his arms and a bit of blood on his nose that would eventually come back as belonging to Kim Wall. But Peter claims he dropped her off on a dock early in the night and then went back out again and ran into a number of mechanical issues. He claims a ballast tank failed and flooded the sub, which ultimately sunk the submarine. The cops in Denmark, not being idiots, file an involuntary manslaughter charge against him so they're able to keep him in custody while they investigate. And, you know, I got to give it to the police in Denmark. They do a great job here, unlike their counterparts over in England with the last case. That's refreshing. Yeah. The submarine is pulled to the surface by a salvage crew, but there's no sign of Kim, though it is obvious that the sub was sunk intentionally. Now, what's really wild is watching the Netflix documentary about this called Into the Deep and seeing his interns and volunteers reacting to all this drama in real time. Because while all this craziness is going on, there's actually an Australian documentary filmmaker named Emma Sullivan filming the whole thing. At first, the filmmakers and interns are incredibly worried when the sub goes missing. They're just stressing out. And then they're flooded with relief when it's found. But when it comes out that the reporter is missing, it's then that things get weird. Some of his loyal interns search the docks where Peter claims to have dropped Kim off. Though there's plenty of SCTV footage around those areas that should have picked her up walking if uh, she'd been dropped off. But the interns soon... And I mean, like, really soon, if you think about it, like, (laughs) they soon turn to start thinking he might be a rapist and a killer. All through the documentary, he'd been behaving oddly, talking about how he'd learned to spoof authorities, that he'd either be known as the greatest of heroes or the greatest of criminals. He'd also exchanged some very odd texts with this intern. She's like this really pretty girl, and it's so sad to see how traumatized she becomes over the course of this documentary. She told him, jokingly, that she was so behind on her work that he needed to threaten her so she'd get all her work done. She's probably expecting him to say he'd take away her cookies or maybe delete her Instagram account if she didn't get cracking and get on that work. Instead, he told her, He wanted to stab her to death and chop her in half, saying, quote, I have a murder plan ready, which is a great pleasure. Red flag. I feel (laughs) like if this was my intern, I'd just be like, I'm going to dock your pay because, ha ha, you're unpaid. (laughs) You get 10% less of nothing. No. Oh, murder plan ready. Okay. Oh, man. I'm going to chop you in half. Where is this going? I think we know. Say to your intern. Well, as someone is reported to have said in the documentary, the ocean, she wouldn't keep her secret. And Kim's torso washed up. Uh, Her head, arms, and legs had been hacked off. And her body was filled with stab wounds, particularly in the pubic area. It had also been bound with a metal pole one would assume in hopes that the body would sink, but obviously it didn't. Did we mention that Madsen had no degree whatsoever in engineering or anything else? It's a miracle that submarine worked as well as it did. You know, he, he towed that rocket launch pad out, and it basically fell apart when they were testing it. Not good. No. Um, and with the torso now found... Madsen changed his story. He said she died when she was accidentally hit in the head by the hatch cover. Madsen says he just panicked. He didn't know what to do. 
So he decided to just get rid of her body in the water. And since he couldn't fit the corpse up the ladder and out the submarine tower, he just dismembered her. You know, plausible, right? Isn't that what you'd do if someone died on your submarine accidentally? Just chop them up and stab their genitals before tossing them out. I'm not a professional submarine captain, but I feel like that's probably not protocol. Oh, so he's just disgusting. And obviously, he's a really bad liar. Um, And the authorities add improper handling of a corpse to his charges as they continue to investigate. But that pathetic excuse doesn't hold up long for either. Because divers, meticulously combing the seafloor in a grid, they find a few things. One of them is a bag with all of Kim's clothing in it, as well as a knife and a saw. Remember that knife and saw he loaded up? That seemed so odd at the time. I remember. Just wonder where the video camera he'd been carrying went. Don't we all? The divers also found a couple of legs just hanging out down there, tied to hunks of metal. They also found another bag. And in it was the head of Kim Wall. I just want to reiterate what an amazing woman this was. She had master's degrees in journalism and international relations, graduating in the top of her class with both one from the London School of Economics, and one from Columbia University in New York City. In her writing assignments, she'd been to Uganda, Kenya, Cuba, Cambodia, even North Korea, covering fascinating stories like the rise of feminism in China, nuclear waste in the Marshall Islands, even how Beatle recordings were being secretly smuggled into communist countries. Oh, that one sounds so interesting. I'd like to read that article. Right? Me too. I love the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Well, they found this woman's head in the bottom of the ocean in a bag weighted down with weird leftover submarine parts. Now, remember how Peter had said her head had been accidentally bashed in by the hatch? Well, there was no sign of blunt force trauma. There was no fractures, nothing. So conveniently, he changes his story again, saying now that she died of carbon monoxide poisoning. But no, they had her lungs, and an autopsy disproved that. So mysterious. Uh, Probably all those stab wounds that did her in. Think so? Eh, Maybe. And then, finally, they're able to get into Peter Matson's computer. It wasn't a pretty sight. No, not at all. It was filled with the most vile and violent of pornography, as well as straight-up snuff films. Authorities studied these snuff films and said they're certain that they're real. Footage of women being raped, tortured, mutilated, and killed that he'd most likely bought and downloaded on the dark web. And what were his last internet searches before he met with Kim Wall? Beheading, pain, and agony. He then watched a video of an unknown young woman rattling and gurgling as her throat was slit. And Madsen just stated that the computer wasn't his, and it must have belonged to one of his interns. These kids, who worked for him for free, they gave him their lives. He just throws them under the bus, man. Mm. And it turns out he'd actually asked several women to go on a submarine that ride that day. Kim Wall just happened to be the one who said yes. He had it all planned out. And if Kim Wall had turned him down as well, well, he'd already arranged to take his pretty earn turn the next day. The one he joked around with about chopping up and having a murder plan ready. Looks like those jokes about a murder plan weren't jokes at all. He's given a psychiatric exam. Doctors described him as a narcissistic sociopath. 
but not psychotic or delusional. They found him to be a pathological liar with a serious lack of empathy, remorse, and guilt. Oh, I'm so surprised. <laughs> not. <laughs> the uh, final charges levied against him are premeditated murder, indecent handling of a corpse, and sexual relations other than in a course of a particularly dangerous nature. I don't even know what that means. Sexual huh. relations other than intercourse of a particularly dangerous nature. It's, I don't, I don't know, know. This sounds gnarly. I don't know if I want to know what that means. <laughs> yeah, right. On April 25th, 2018, he was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment. He tried to escape once. It was just sad, and pathetic, not even worth getting into. But one thing I do want to mention is that in the Netflix documentary, remember uh, that filmmaker just happened to be around when all this went down. The last thing that he says to her, and it's like, they're all done with filming. The production's shutting down. And he just throws this out completely unprompted. Are you aware that sociopaths live amongst us? Human predators that walk around, grab people, and use them then throw them out used. There are human predators amongst us, and psychopathic people are often very charismatic. They're excellent speakers. They're convincing. They have illusions of self-grandeur and have no regard for anyone else. There is the possibility that you have simply come upon a human predator. He then shrugs and asks if Psychopaths know they're psychopaths. And I think we know the answer right there. Hell yeah, they know it. At least this one did. What about that video camera he was seen going into the submarine with? It was never found. But knowing Matson liked to secretly film his sexual escapades, and in that documentary, there's some really disturbing footage of him setting up a camera so it's looking down at his bed so he can do this. So, yeah, many assume that on it is a submarine snuff film. Oh. What's striking to me is just how different these two killers are. One is charismatic, outgoing, and charming. He's a swinger. He's married. Doesn't seem to have any problem with the ladies at all. The other is introverted, shy, and an incel. One is highly successful, Goal orientated. The other is a recluse that works in a gas station and lives in his parents' house at 24. But they both adored the most violent and cruel, degrading and twisted types of pornography. They both liked to see women tortured so much that they fantasized about making their own snuff films and acted out those fantasies. Both were deemed sociopaths by court-appointed psychiatrists. What do you make of all of this, Sarah? As many as 85% of serial killers are thought to have psychopathic personalities. In the DSM, psychopathy is best described as a subtype of antisocial personality disorder. Specifically, the authors of the DSM-5 describes psychopathy as a distinct variant of antisocial personality disorder. Psychopathy as a term was in the first two versions of the DSM, but it was removed, partially due to concerns about stigmatizing patients and partially due to a fear that clinicians would have difficulty objectively measuring behaviors related to cruelty and lack of empathy. When we discuss psychopathy, Clinically, we examine specific behavioral aspects of antisocial personality disorder. These are cases where aggression, impulsivity, and violations of others' rights are exhibited prominently. And it's worth noting only about a third of those diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder also meet the criteria for psychopathy. According to the American Psychological Association, New research suggests it may be more descriptive to view psychopathy on a spectrum, 
as a series of traits that varies continuously throughout the population. Chris Patrick's triarctic model describes psychopathy as a cluster of three separable traits, disinhibition, meanness, and boldness. Disinhibition as a category measures impulsivity, emotional regulation, and social responsibility. The category of meanness measures levels of predatory behavior, mistrust, and contempt for others. And the category of boldness describes levels of dominance, social assurance, emotional resilience, and adventurousness. Because the three traits of this model are separable, this system would expand the language clinicians have to describe subtypes of psychopathy and would facilitate more nuanced dialogue about them. For example, someone with a bold, disinhibited style of psychopathy would behave different than someone with a mean, disinhibited type of psychopathy. And researchers could identify commonalities in neurobiological processes implicated in the development and the treatment of each subtype. I can't argue with court-appointed psychiatrists here. I think both of these guys are exhibiting psychopathy on a clinical level. But in the coming years, the field of psychology may have more language with which to describe the differences in that presentation. Wow. So fascinating. And that's going to do it for today's dose of mayhem and murder. Be sure to tune in next week when we'll take the topic of snuff film to a whole new level and study the mirror maze of the internet. That's right, dear listeners and fellow freaks. Today was only a warm up. We're going to really get into it next week. Yep, that was only your prerequisite. So <laughs> thanks so much Later. for listening, dear listeners and fellow freaks. Hey, we want to hear from you. Got a case you think we should cover? Do we get something wrong? Or do you just want to say hi? Drop us a line at murdercoasterpodcast at gmail.com. That's murdercoasterpodcast at gmail.com. Catch you later. <laughs>